uh, we are here to have a, a conversation, a conversation around what does it look like to, um, as we're calling it uh, today, what does it look like to act justly um, and to uh, walk humbly in a racially tense um, nation, a race, ra racially tense um, society? And there's been a lot of conversations around race, around uh, um, this call to uh, nation, uh, the nation's call to heal, um, the growing unity. So we're going to just have a conversation about these things and other things um, as brothers in Christ. Um, hopefully, we can gain um, something from it for from each other, and then hopefully, um, this uh, can be a resource that is valuable to you as you listen. And so, um, with that, I'm going to uh, just kick off our conversation with a, with a question, and then we'll just have a conversation from there. So, um, just want to um, each of us to kind of go around to share how are we currently feeling and mentally, emotionally. A lot of where we are now is just a check-in. How are you feeling when it comes to, particularly when it comes to where we are as a people, where we are as a nation, where we are as a church um, around the issues of unity? So, yeah, um, so a really good question. And yeah, as I reflect on that, uh, a couple of things come to mind. So, uh, as I read through the scriptures as a Christian, uh, as I read through the scriptures, several things become like painfully aware, um, rising to the surface for me. So uh, I think America holds out a, a particular promise, right? And I think that, that that particular promise is that today, excuse me, tomorrow will be better or brighter than uh, yesterday or today, right? So the future seems like this, this bright shining, uh, star, uh, and then like uh, highlighting a, a brighter path forward for all those who, who choose to, to travel that road. Uh, the problem is, you know, America has a, uh, what I like to call, uh, similar to the nation of Israel, not that America is Israel, but for the sake of the example, um, Israel struggled with a particular case, or a, 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 a persistent case of spiritual amnesia, right? So, mm -hmm. It would always be a situation where, like, if you forget the Lord your God, this will happen to you, right? This will happen. So, like, if you were those who remember the Lord will be blessed in this way. Those who forget the Lord their God will be cursed in this way. Or their, their, their folly will lead them down a path of destruction. Uh, and not to say that America has the same spiritual amnesia, but I think we do have a historical amnesia. Uh, and what I mean by that is that there is a particular historical narrative that's been cast in America where people who look like Rodney and I um, have entered this country as uh, property, right? So yes, America has held out in light of that promise, right? A brighter tomorrow in, in spite of today. Um, in my lifetime, in my, as an adult, I'm 32 years old, and I've seen in my lifetime as an adult, uh, America's first African uh, a president of African descent uh, and vice president, um, female of, of people of African descent, of East Asian descent. So I think that there is a brighter tomorrow, but we have a failure, our failure to learn from the, the failures of the past will allow us to think, yes, we are making great strides, but without eliminating some of the core presuppositions that undergird, you know, tension and beef and strife between American citizens, um, creates, you know, undue uh, beef and, and continuous struggle. Uh, and this is the last thing I'll say. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said, you know, that uh, if I find within myself uh, desires that nothing in this world could satisfy, then I can only conclude that I wasn't made for this world, right? Um, and that I must look to, to be beyond uh, this world's shores for, great, for, for true joy. So we see that America has forgotten a lot of things um, so the good thing for the Christian for my, for that I'm clinging to is that God uh, is, is intimately acquainted with his people, right? Followers of Jesus, those who truly know him, right? Uh, and he is committed to keeping um, his word, even though America fails to keep its promises. So that, I would say that's where I'm at. Yeah, yeah. I like what you said as far as the historical amnesia. Um, one of the things I've been looking at is the the uh, comparison of where we are, were the same time 160 years ago, 1860, right. when they elected Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. um, people are comparing Abraham Lincoln's election to the election we just had, where 
the nation is in a very tense place, um, very divided. If you look at the election results, a lot of states, 50% voted one way, 50% voted the other way. And you have this tension and then you are electing someone who you hope can bring healing. Um, mm -hmm. But as we saw 160 years ago, that didn't happen. Lincoln was elected mm -hmm. a year later, we're in a full blown civil war. It cost over 600,000 lives. Um, mm -hmm. And at the core of that fight was the value of black people. And right. many would say that was one of the core tenets of this election. How valuable are the lives of black people when it comes to who you vote for? Um, mm -hmm. That was, Many would say that that was on the ballot. Racial justice was, was on the ballot. And so I think it's, it's interesting to see that here we are hundreds of years later and we there, it, things are brighter because we're not fighting for whether or not black people should be enslaved, but there are still uh, remnants that show that we haven't quite learned everything we need to learn. And so where I am right now is just that so, that sober reality. There's a lot of things that are repeating itself in American history, and here we are again with that. Um, and so I'm just kind of digesting what does it um, look like for us as a nation moving forward to learn from those mistakes, and more or less, mm -hmm. and also will we learn? Like, will will we have enough? Sorry, not will we learn, but will we move forward based on what we what we've learned from the past? Like, right. we can look at the past, but will that change our tomorrow? Um, and mm -hmm. kind of what you're saying, Maurice, there is that dangling of the American dream of is a brighter tomorrow, brighter tomorrow. And most of us believe in that, but it's like, what are we going to actually do to make tomorrow brighter? There's right. some, that's kind of where I'm coming from today when it comes to uh, feelings on where we are currently. What about yourself, Brian? Yeah, I, I think I could echo a lot of what both of you are saying. And it's kind of a profound disappointment and then a profound not being surprised mm, and trying exactly. to balance those two emotions where it's you you let hope in things look like they're getting a little bit better people like you feel like you're taking getting steam and then everyone not everyone but there's a large portion of people that say hey let's hit the brakes let's let's not go too fast let's slow down and it feels like when you look at the lessons of history it's the same thing that happens every time that there are advancements made um, for persons of color and, and people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, let's take several steps back. Um, and it's, it's hard because you, or for myself, I let myself get hopeful. And then the hope gets, you know, and, and it feels like the cycle that, that constantly is happening. Um, and you, you keep hope because as a Christian, like that is fundamental is hope, but maybe not always hope right here right now right. and trying to learn how to balance that and balance still working still going forward still doing what you can with the understanding that it's not going to go as fast towards justice right. as you want it to and that's hard because it, it means that you're for myself it means my emotions ebb and flow some days i'm excited about it and some days i'm just like I just want to, I just don't even want to get out of bed, you know, it's, right, right. It, it, because it's like, and so it's, it's a hard thing to say, like, I feel different depending on the hour sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And you know, and, and you know, what makes me, what, what comes to my mind with that though, is that, isn't that just like what life is like in a fallen world, right? So I think we, we are naturally tempted to put our hope in things and the, the world in which we live is kind of built and structured around constantly clinging to and clamoring for your deepest hopes and your deepest affections. Uh, and because of that, there's, there's a great opportunity to be excited at progress, but also mm -hmm. let down by the consistent flow of how things normally are, which is why I, the, you know, you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, where Solomon, Kohelis, right? So Solomon is like, yo, like everything is vanity, vanity under the sun. Like, like there's a time to do this, there's a time to do that. He's laying out all these different things under the sun. But the, 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 the conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes, where Solomon says, you know, uh, fe like the, the conclusion of the matter, the conclusion of all of these vain, these vain things is to fear God and keep his commandments, right? So the, the thing for the, the hope for the Christian is that we don't live strictly under the sun, like under the way things are right now. The call for the follower of Jesus, those who truly know Christ, is to look beyond the sun, right? Like to put our hope in something that is unmovable and unchangeable as the world changes around us. So that doesn't mean we 
be escape into this vape, this vapid, you know, at, like I'm looking strictly, my eyes are strictly on eternity, but rather, no, like I'm, I'm focusing on, like my eyes on eternity, but my hands on the earth. You know what I mean? So as I move, I'm moving in the earth in light of eternity, right? right. In light of these, these, where we're ultimately headed. So history uh, has an end date. You know, we, we just don't know that. So our call isn't to have all the politics figured out, all the race relations stuff figured out. Although we move, we make strides in all these, these areas. It's like, no, nah, like the, the, the call isn't necessarily to correct and fix every single broken thing in the world, rather to be faithful as we, we, we're marching on in faithfulness. Uh, as both followers of Jesus, the followers of Jesus who has faith that is, it spills over into our action in terms of how we treat one another, our political engagement, how we view conversations about ethnicity and justice and equity, all of that, knowing our efforts are working out purposes that we can't, we might not even be able to see. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And so like on that note, we look beyond the sun, S-U-N, and we keep our focus on the sun, S-O-N. I see what you did there. I see yeah, what yeah, you yeah. did. <laughs> yeah. So um, um, as we do that, um, you know, oftentimes, like you said, there's this, there's this balance of how do we um, balance between looking at eternity and, and the here and now. When we talk mm -hmm. about the here and now, oftentimes when we have these conversations, there's a lot of, you know, we're talking abstracts, you know. Right, um, right. Like practical things or practical ways in which we can move towards what would be, what we would look at as being just, what we would look at as being right here on this earth. What are, what are the thoughts y'all have around that as far as what are the practical steps that we can take in the here and now that mm -hmm. will be pleasing to our eternal father, but also, and also um, create unity in the here and now. Mm. Yeah. One of the things that I was um, struck by um, recently in reading in uh, Deuteronomy was there's a passage that um, talks about how there will always be poor among you. Mm -hmm. And then the next step is, and therefore take care of the poor. Mm. Um, because a lot of times, you know, we, there's always going to be poor among you. Sometimes it can feel like, okay, therefore don't, so don't worry about it. But actually right. the step is there's always going to be poverty. So take care of it. And when we think of poverty, there's the financial poverty, but there's also the poverty of broken relationships, whether mm -hmm. that be, and that's not just race that can be, you know, by sexism, by like, there's all sorts of ways that relationships are broken. But one of the big ones that is broken, especially where we live, is along race lines. Mm -hmm. And part of it is, I feel like there will always be some level of disunity. Mm -hmm. But therefore, we need to be working towards unity. There will always be some lack of justice. Therefore, we need to be working towards justice. Mm -hmm. I know that's not a practical step, um, but it's just something that I've been thinking on as I've been hearing a lot of different people talking about unity and that we need unity, we need unity. Unity is important, but no one ever really defines what is unity mm -hmm. and what are we unified in? Because right. you can be unified in very, very bad things. Mm -hmm. So unity for the sake of unity is not a virtue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we look at history, the, the KKK in history was pretty unified. They were pretty effective because they were unified by beliefs and in actions. And the result is not something that we want, nor something that we want to be unified in. So I think that the first question we need to come and discuss is what is, what does unity actually look like in a practical right. sense? And what are we being unified in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. You still, you, you still in my words, but get, get out of my head. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I was going to say, man, um, I think that our strides and uh, our movements, if you will, like our actions towards unity. Um, I think, I think there's two sides of that, right? So on the one side, we are living in the, like we're in the world, right? And the world uh, is filled with, uh, uh, I mean, it's like this mixed multitude, right? So you have people who know Jesus or uh, Christians or people who are, who don't know Jesus, who are people who are not Christians. And so what does unity look like on both fronts, right? So I think that on the one side, if I'm dealing with, so my, you know, for the purposes of this conversation, a conversation about race, um, or like or ethnicity, I think it's the, the world's understanding of unity is the absence of strife and struggle, right? So I can coexist. And so coexisting looks almost like just tolerating me, like, like right. toleration of difference. Um, and I think that there is a such thing as like, you know, 
forbearance, meaning I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to crush you uh, for your disagreements and all that type of, for our, the points in which we disagree. But even that point is a distinctly Christian point. I think our unity, to Brian's point, is the last thing I'll say, um, has to serve a purpose, right? It's, it's unity, yes, but unity for what? Like, what is that unity to accomplish? Uh, and to Brian's point, there's unity everywhere. There's unity across a bunch of different lines, but there's also unity in hell, right? Like, yeah. people are unified in their disobedience and the, the suffering judgment because of it. Uh, so our unity has to be something that's distinct, but not distinct as in separate totally, but distinct as in calling people to live in, live in this unity and live out of it. Uh, right. But that's, that's the only way we're going to accomplish any real good in the world as Christians. Yeah. Yeah, we looked at American history. I mean, the whole foundation of America is based off of this this thought of uni unity, and so mm -hmm. we are the United States of America. We fought a civil war to preserve the union of the nation. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. More recently, as we look into our parents' lifetime and trickle down our lifetime, there was this thought of like, how can we unify among ethnic groups? We have all these ethnic groups, which we we're, we're about. We're about bringing people in, even though people of African descent were enslaved into this. A lot of people were, came to America on the dream of just this unity among races, among ethnic groups. And we settled on um, tolerance. And so there was no real goal besides, let's just try to tolerate one another. But that hasn't worked, you know? It hasn't really worked mm -hmm. of these racial stripes and et cetera. And so unity cannot simply be just this, this kumbaya, as I like to say, where we're all in the same rooms, so we have unity. That's not unity at all. Like that's mm -hmm. just everybody in the same room. It looks different, you know? Mm -hmm. And so for me, the practical way to get there is one, we have to be aware of one another in our actual history, um, both mm. our uh, our felt emotional history, our mental history, how we struggle in this nation. We gotta just learn one another better. And that's awareness work, which is where I focus a lot of my attention on. And then once mm -hmm. we become more aware of one another, there's gonna be a time of, lament and grief i think that's what we see a lot in the old testament prophets just you know as we see the sins and the ways in which we've fallen short of god's glory we have to lament the way in which we've treated one another wrong the way in which we have not achieved remember this nation was built under the premise of one nation under god and we haven't mm. achieved that and so like we have to grieve those things and then all of this is under the umbrella of we are moving towards the the greatest commandment love one another and so we do this under the tenet of how are we loving one another? How are we, as Maurice was saying, um, we are not, you know, if we disagree, okay, all of a sudden that's it. Like, how are we working through these disagreements? How are Cancel. We, you're can exactly. 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 Right, right. And like, instead of casting someone, oh, you're, you're too conservative or you're too liberal. And we put people in these political parties or whatever. We want to put them in these boxes and then we want to cast them away. How do we learn about one another uh, better, you know? Um, I think with um, relational capital is a word I like to use, um, and building relationships with one another and having that capital goes a long way to where when we do disagree, um, we, can, we can work through that. Um, but I think ultimately, like I said, our goal is, um, as we said at the beginning of this time, we do believe as Americans in this better tomorrow. Um, right. That was the hope, that's why the greatest speech of the 20th century I have a dream speech. That's exactly what it was. It was a call to a better tomorrow among mm -hmm. racial groups. And like everyone is a, attracted to that. Um, and I think that's a good thing, but we still have work to do as far as achieving that reality. And so um, I think when it comes to just unity and practicality, those are, that's one of the steps I would take. Um, but do yeah. you all have like examples in your own lives or people you've seen that have taken some real steps towards unity among ethnic groups um, that you want to um, uplift, you know, something you've done in your own life, something you've seen other people do. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So I, the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, so I think that the, let's be clear. So I, I, I love uh, history. I'm a student of history, uh, uh, history. I have history degrees and um, always been a historical critic of sorts. So, I love history. I love it, love it, love it. Especially African American history, especially uh, American history, and especially within the antebellum uh, period of American history. So, there is a sense to where uh, we need. I think our learned experiences, um, our, our learned experiences, our lived experience, excuse me, creates. Um, if we're not careful, it, it, regardless of how much you you love 
history, your lived experience, if you're not careful, can create this, these, this, seg- this fragmentation of how I see the world and how you see the world. Look at American history to, to make that point, right? So um, I, for example, um, I, rem- I remember years ago, uh, 2012, uh, me and another brother, uh, white brother, he, uh, we, did, we did not get along, <laughs> not, not at all. And, um, but um, we both were members of the same church and members of the same small group and the, members of the same, like, we, we lived around each other and like kind of on the margins of one another's lives. Uh, and I remember just having a conversation with him and saying, hey man, I really wanna, I wanna learn um, your, I wanna learn more about you, not you, your people as in white people, but I wanna, I wanna know you. Um, and what I didn't realize I was doing is in that conversation, I was taking this much content from American history um, and squeezing it into, into that one relationship, thereby judging him on the basis of things he's probably never said, never done, has no historical connection to, any of the, that type of stuff. So now I'm, I'm lambasting my brother in the name of trying to help him to see this grand scope, and I'm trying to sweep him into these categories that he doesn't neatly fit into. I have, and the same thing was happening to me, so from him to me. But what happened is that I had to ask the question, and this goes back to the previous question of uh, you know, what practical things are we doing? I think organizations and individuals also have always have to ask the question, what are you willing to give up to embody the vision of unity that the gospel calls us to? And there was a certain degree of angst and frustration in my mind, righteous indignation, <laughs> which in many ways this was pride from being keeping it 100. You know, um, this, this, this desire to learn without having to give up anything, right? Um, and I'm having to give up things in this relationship, but he was too, right? And I think in a very real way, um, our, our relationships and our lives are kind of structured in that way where we've, we've built up certain proclivities and assumptions and presuppositions about one another that when we come into relationship with one another, there's going to be a natural friction but what are we, what is that? It, hopefully that friction is sharpening one another um, and pushing us both, not necessarily strictly a, up against one another, but up against the cross um, to the point where I'm having to lay down things. Dag, man, I was wrong for the way that I done it, I treated you. Uh, and to the point we, like I said, me and his brother Charles, we didn't like each other. Um, and so he eventually became one of my a really good friends. And I ended up, he ended up, um, I ended up becoming his best man in his wedding. Uh, and I know everybody's situation doesn't work out that way. Um, so I'm not using my experience as a way to silence all other, you know, perspectives and agree like issues and whatnot. But I will say that sacrifice and sacrifice, purposeful sacrifice, is 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 is, is better than this assumption that everything is going to work itself out as well because we know Jesus. Like, no, that, that's just not a real thing. Right, right. Yeah, amen to that for sure. Yeah, I, I, one of the things you said though is uh, about the giving up. Um, I think. Mm-hmm. There's a few things there I, um, in my own experience of it not going well um, when it comes to unity across racial lines is whenever the call wasn't really to give up. It was really to assimilate. And it was mm. more so like mm. me as the person of color having to give up my personality, my, my who I am to assimilate to what already is. And there wasn't space created for me to be me. And so mm. that's where it can be, where it can go wrong as far as, you know, um, you have to give a person of color in order to fit into what already is, to what already is is good enough, you know, right. um, where real unity is how we're both giving up um, things. Cause, I, Cause at the same time, I do believe there is a, um, a reality to myself. That there are things I have to give up to make relationship work, which is like mm-hmm. you said, fun, funneling all your anger, all your his, historical narrative into one person because of their skin being white mm-hmm. and then having them carry that full burden. That's not fair either, you know. Who can bear that? Who can bear right, that? Right, 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 you know? right, right, right. Exactly. And so, like, understanding that. And so, um, I think that's very critical when it comes to, um, you know, making thing, doing this thing right. So, some things that worked well for me, um, I, I ran, I led this uh, book study um, where we had people that were both um, white, people that were black in the same book study. It, it, was a, it was a book study, it was a book written by an African-American woman and so learning about her life story and then using that to share, how does this, um, how does this make you think about your own life story, your own narrative when it comes to mm-hmm. race? 
How is race mm-hmm. important to you as a kid? How is race important to you as a, as a young adult? How is race important to you now? If, if you're a parent now raising your kids. And so like, we all had, we all had to answer the same questions. We had different perspectives based on who we were. Right. But we were right. all able to learn from one another, how that feels. And there was some eye opening um, times. There was eye opening moments like, I didn't know you struggled with this. Or I didn't know you saw things like this. And I think just mm-hmm. that, having that level playing field and people being willing to listen to one another, learn from mm-hmm. one another, um, help grow that unity to where from there, we're able to have deeper one-on-one conversations, build that relational capital I was talking about, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Another thing that I think goes well when it comes to unity is how do we embrace, and this kind of goes in, you know, what the whole diversity and um, what that looks like in a good way is how do we embrace people who are different? And so mm-hmm. I, I've, I've done um, this thing where we did a potluck where we had people of different ethnic groups bring food that was unique to their culture. They were able to celebrate their culture. And so oftentimes mm-hmm. we learn to tolerate, but we don't learn to celebrate and really celebrate mm-hmm. the differences, you know, That's which good. is what That's ultimately good. <clears throat> heaven, right? The celebration of people of different ethnic groups all worshiping one God. Um, right. And then um, I know Brian um, led, um, I'll let him speak on it more, but Brian led something similar when it came to celebrating people um, who are different and how that really goes into um, creating unity, growing unity in a practical way. You want to share more about that, Brian, and what you did a couple months ago when it came to celebrating women? Oh, I was, <laughs> I was, yes, I was lost man. for a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I do. I want to go to a, something else real quick and then come back to it. Yeah. Um, one thing that I have seen um, that goes a little bit more to Marisa's point um, is that one of the things that unity does is it does conflict well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I think at least for myself in the way that I grew up um, specifically in what I would term more the white evangelical church mm-hmm. um, is that we we grew up learning that unity was like avoiding conflict mm. and it was mm. living in peace meant living without any strife or problems yeah. um and it really didn't equip me very well uh for for living uh in that sense because conflict is going to arise anytime you have when two or more are gathered there will be conflict <laughs> uh regardless of there's always going to be differences race is one that we deal with a lot specifically here and what we're talking about but obviously that any relationship there's going to be conflict Mm -hmm. um and how we handle conflict and when conflict arises is what actually shows us if we have unity Mm -hmm. because if you can be in a relationship with a person and there's never conflict you really don't know if there's unity or not unity Mm -hmm. and so to me I, i think a lot about like what i've learned through marriage really speaks into what it looks like to to be unified um, Amen. because coming from different backgrounds same ethnicity but coming from different backgrounds coming from different family structures coming from different goals sometimes the the idea that i've really settled on is that we're on the same team and that what that means is i want the best for you mm-hmm. but for myself um and that it's you know, I think that goes back to the Christian ethic of love someone as you would love yourself. Right, you would right. Want what you would want someone else to want for you, you want for that person. Right. So if we're looking at this from a, a structure of racial unity, it's, you know, I, I want what's best for you. And the only way I can find that is by not silencing you and listening to you. Because the first thing that every person, I, from my experience and my work, the thing that people want is to be heard. They want people to understand them. People understanding you is, is very important, I think, as a, as a human, um, because it, it allows for us to make progress. And the way that, as a person who you know works, I work in Rwanda, there's a lot of different power dynamics there. I have to learn to be able to, um, do we lose Maurice? Is he yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. I'm here. It froze. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Okay, no worries. Um, and so, like, I have to learn for myself is like, I, if you're ever in a position of like power or authority, which mm-hmm. a lot of times I think as a white male, I de facto get put into, like, mm-hmm. honestly. Um, and you have to learn to like surrender <clears throat> that 
um, and to understand that your words, that my words, the things I say can silence people. Mm -hmm. And, and there's a history behind that. There is a history yeah. of silencing people, um, both in terms of the work that I do in Rwanda through colonial colonialization, but also if we're doing any sort of reconciliation type work in the States, mm -hmm. it's very easy to silence people um, right. when you're in a position right. of power and to use that position of power to stop <clears throat> conflict rather than stepping back and saying, I need to listen. I need to not take offense because that's where right. a lot of our conflicts break down is the automatic thing is I take offense because it feels like when you say this about white people, it's an attack on me, right? right. That's how a lot of people take it. And to take a step back and say, it's not stop worrying about yourself and worry about how this person is feeling. Right. You don't need to silence emotions. Emotions right. are important. This is emotional. So it's right. important not to silence emotions. You don't need to silence pain. That mm -hmm. is not biblical. Amen. Jesus did not silence pain. Yeah. Jesus was with people when they were in pain and he was, he listened to them and he didn't just give them advice on how to fix mm -hmm. it. He was with them. <laughs> So right. stop trying to fix everything, <laughs> but, but listen, and when yeah. you need to repent, generational sin is a thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay. People are always like, well, that was my ancestors. No, generational sin is a thing. It's okay to like realize there are times where you need to repent. And I'm saying as a white person, I'm not saying, mm -hmm. but for myself, I'm only speaking for myself that, right. um, a lot of times when I hear people talk about forgiveness, we only talk about the forgiver. Mm. We never talk about what it looks like as a Christian to seek forgiveness right. very rarely. And my wife was pointing this out to me that people are always like, well, you should forgive 70 times seven. You should forgive. You should forgive. You should forgive. Well, what if you're the person who always is the one needing to ask for forgiveness? Mm. And mm. we look at the examples, you know, it says lay your offering like leave your offering at the altar and go make things right. And right. we look at um, Jacob and Esau. And again, I'm going to give this credit to my wife because she's the one who came up with this. She's not on this call, but she's the one who came up with this telling me about <laughs> yeah. this is what did he do when he, when Jacob went to seek forgiveness from Esau, he sent people ahead of him with mm -hmm. gifts to make things right. He like, and then he came seven times himself to present himself asking for forgiveness seven times and insisted mm -hmm. that he did things to make it right. And so I think that part of it is we always put the burden on the person who, who needs to forgive. Mm -hmm. That as a, as a Christian, well, you should forgive. Right. And, and I think that a large, and I, I can't speak for black people, but I feel like as a white person, we put a large amount of burden on black people to forgive. Right. Now, I think what, you, what you're bringing up is, is, is huge. So I think that the reality is like people, it, that type of embodying of, a, of, of what it means. Oh, oh I muted. <laughs> That's why you asked me, did he lose me? But I was listening. Um, I think what you're saying is right. You know, that we, many people fear that, you know, that sort of uh, embodiment of a Christian ethic. I think, I think some things can be taken to an extreme, right? Like if you're white, you are a racist because you're white, right? Or uh, I'm not saying that. I'm saying but people could take things to an extreme, right? So it's like, yes, what we want is people to rightly assess the historical data, and not just the historical data, but the implications that flow from that. Like how has... So if we, look, if we would agree that America was founded, you know, on the basis of, on a property that was stolen <laughs> from the natives that were here and that people were brought in, you know, as, as property, um, you know, and, you know, when our, um, in 1776, you know, people love to play Hamilton, right? Like Hamilton's everywhere, but we're not, we're not really dealing with the implications of when our, when our constitution was, uh, was constructed, that there was an opportunity because we, have, we, we left uh, colonial rule um, right. uh, European British rule to to do away with slavery, right? To to have all three people truly be equal. Um, we we had an opportunity there, but we we shirked that, right? So there's a there's a there are his, there's a historical data, historical information that 
you know, is has implications for like housing, redlining, people being forced to move into uh, unfair housing covenants and all this type of stuff, right? So you have all of these different implications that are, that are at work. Um, while at the same time, I think sometimes people fear that own, like, and rightly assessing that data is somehow in a personal indictment on me. Uh, and if, in many ways, it, it might be, in many ways, it may not be, right? So th that's where I may differ with a person who says, you know, uh, what I want to, with a person who says, well, if you're white, you need to repent exclusively of your, the, your whiteness. Now, I know what they mean sociologically, but m my, my pushback would be, you know, cultures and ethnic groups throughout history have changed, right? So one person could be European at one point, but Europe wasn't always known as Europe. Right, like certain places in Africa weren't always known as those those places. Um, so there's nothing in and of itself wrong with you being a, 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 a being white, right, or of European descent. So, but we we just acknowledge that the idea of being white, right, white and black, are not real things, right? When people were brought into uh, this country, you know, they were you you weren't black. <laughs> you were from a particular tribe or a particular, with a particular language or a particular uh, lineage and heritage and all type of stuff. And the same goes for our European uh, uh, counterparts. Uh, but another thing that people typically uh, reject is the idea that, you know, well, I'm, all you need to do is preach the gospel, right? If I'm just, just preach the gospel and then it work itself out. Well, we have to understand, right? So God has not given believers a whole bunch of means or ways and avenues through which they can grow into Christ's likeness, right? He's given us a very, a very few things, right? So in Acts 2.42, it says that the early believers gave themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the prayers, breaking of bread, um, and, 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 and the prayers. Um, but we have to understand, like, yes, preach the gospel, preach the gospel, preach the gospel. I hear you, but do you not think you ignoring the historical, like historical background and baggage that I bring into this kind of this relationship as a as a black person or an African African American person, you don't think that's going to hurt our fellowship? <laughs> you know, that's going to hurt our ability to rightly pray for one another. That's going to hurt my ability to hear the apostles teaching the Bible from you when you are ignoring my suffering, my pain. I always say this: I don't take people's faith seriously if that person doesn't take suffering seriously. Mm, that's good. I, so if you if you don't if you're not taking my my suffering seriously, why do I have to hear what you're saying? You know, like why would I why should I take that seriously at all? So I think in in many ways what Brian is saying is is so real and so true. I think that the, this there's the thing that brushes up against that is just our natural tendency towards pride. And pride, you know, is known as the great sin because all sin springs from that. So that, you know, so I think that we we have a grand opportunity, but also a grand challenge. The good news is that we have the gospel. As well, which is why I, I, I couch my answer to your previous question as how do we have this conversation as followers of Jesus on the one side, but also dealing with unbelievers on the other side, because I, I'm not going to expect the unbelieving white person or unbelieving black person, whoever unbelieving any person to embody a Christian ethic. Um, and I think the, the more we, we can lay down that side of it, then we can begin to, as the followers of Jesus, reflect something back into the world that actually worth living. Because the Christian ethic isn't just good, it's better for all people. Um, so if it's not a, if it's an ethic that's unlivable, then it's going to cause a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah. I'll pick back on th that thought of just um, this Christian ethic around sin. And I think oftentimes, right. Right. unfortunately, that is even used uh, in a way that's unhelpful. <laughs> some people are like, right. I've heard people say, well, this is a sin issue. So therefore, just give it to Jesus, and then that's it. I have I have no role in it myself, you know. It's like <laughs> right, you just give it to Him, and they have no practicality what that looks like, you know. And there's no um, laying down, there's no you know um, uh, laying down privilege, laying down power. There's not, none of that. It's mm -hmm. just like give it over. I, I think ultimately um, we have to look at what Jesus did, which is He embodies what does it look like for someone of privilege, someone of power to lay that down um, in a way to where it's healthy. And so um, practically what it looks like for me is um, in, in America history, there's never been a time when black people have had privilege and power over white people. We've been able to, thankfully, have, have, we've been able to be blessed in certain ways um, through legislation and other ways where we are not enslaved and some of us have um, and, and enjoy you no know, economic freedoms and that kind of stuff. And so 
we would not say as a as a, a community we are all oppressed anymore. Uh, so, right, but right. we at the same time have not achieved, and even though we've had a black president, we have not necessarily achieved full, you know, power and privilege over another um, another people group, mainly white people. And so, what would you like for someone who is white, who has through his history has had different things laid out to where they have power, have privilege? Um, how do they reconcile that? And so, some would say, "What well, happened so so long ago?" But there's right. things that happen. <clears throat> lifetime that is um that has kept you know certain people in power some people are privileged um mm -hmm. as recently as five six years ago the re redrawing of lines you know to help a certain political party certain political ideology to stay mm -hmm. in power you know things like that that have happened in our lifetime and so there's this idea of laying down um at the same time oftentimes uh, this is where pride could come in a little bit or um or where other sin could come in is that it could be easy for me as a black person to sit back and then say, okay, it all falls in the white person now. Um, right. I, I say there's and, different yeah. burdens. There's different burdens. Um, right. I think for the white person, the burden of, you know, confession um, of, of, of the sins of, of America's past, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's that whole, like, how do you reach out and restitution, reparations. When I say reparations, I don't necessarily mm -hmm. mean giving black people handouts and checks, but more so, how do I um, repair the brokenness of, my, of the relationship between white and black people in America? How do I repair that in, in real practical ways? Um, so I think that <clears throat> burden falls on white people, but then I think for black people, we, we do have the burden of forgiveness to an extent. Like we have that burden of, it is hard to want to forgive um, some, when there's so much to be forgiven, but we do have Christ who forgave us of all of our sins. And so like, mm. We have different burdens, um, um, and, but we both have to be willing to give up something, lay down something. And us as black people, we don't have necessarily national privilege that we have to lay down, but we do have, we could be like the guy who, the unforgiving servant in the Bible, who, you know, had a, had a, had, was paid a great debt, you know, which for us would be, we even paid our sin debt, but then we aren't willing to pay off the race debt that other people owe us, you know? Mm -hmm. It is a debt that is owed us, but we have to be willing to forgive that um, in a way that is healthy and pure and um, holy. And so I think there's that, that balance there of just um, how do we um, move towards unity in a way to where we are giving up, we are carrying um, burdens, um, and then we are not ignoring that there are differences based on where we are. Because like you were saying, like we cannot simply, and I've seen this done wrong, we can't simply just come together and say, well, since we're all Christian and we're all in the same room, we just can't ignore everything that's ever happened in American history, as if it means, right, right. It, it means a whole lot. We have to reconcile those things. So I think we need to give room for one another to, to have that internal, internally sanctifying, course-correcting community. Where over the end goal in this isn't to simply argue, it isn't simply to have friction. It's really so that we can look like Jesus and show the world what God is like and what he's up to in the world. That's the goal. Amen, amen. The scriptures say, blessed are the peacemakers. Let's right. say keepers, but peacemakers. And right, they will be right, called right. children of God. And so may we make peace by mm -hmm. being corrected, by iron sharpening iron, by being willing to have our our uh, views change. We don't mm -hmm. we don't change on the on the idea of Jesus being a son of God. We don't change on doctrine, but mm -hmm. we, we can change when it comes to you know how we navigate in this world that we live in. And so right. um amen to that. Well, I, I appreciate this. This has been, this has been great. Uh, I appreciate this conversation. Um, and uh, may, may this be a, this has been a blessing to me. May this be a blessing to all of us as we, as we move forward when it comes to growing in our unity and when it comes to walking humbly, acting justly in, in a racially tense nation. Um, yes. So may, may we be blessed by this. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. All right, oh, guys. Yeah.